Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about the 2002 film adaptation, and I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, writer Trisha Arand. Hello, everybody. Writer Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And for this video, director Alex Cayeros. Hello. So adaptation is a movie about a guy writing the movie that you're watching. And as a writer, I feel like it's a very cathartic watch because it really captures the insanity and the stress of writing a screenplay. And so way back when, like within the first year of starting the channel, I had the idea that it'd be really fun because people request a Charlie Kaufman script all the time. And it was like, okay, Mm -hmm. well, doing a video essay about the screenwriting of adaptation just seems like a natural idea because it's about screenwriting. So wouldn't it be fun to do a video about me trying to figure out how to do a video about (laughs) adaptation? Uh, (laughs) I also like that when I I joined the team, I was like, you know what you should do? And you're like, yeah, I know. Oh, way ahead of you, buddy. Well, I feel like it's it's it does just seem like if you know the movie and you like are in on the idea of the channel, it's like a natural idea if you mm-hmm. like kind of spend a little bit of time right. thinking about it. But it's easier said than done mm-hmm. or easier thought than executed. <laughs> I guess. Definitely. I mean, yeah, I think you pitched that to me very early on in the channel and I immediately just got like those kind of movie chill excitement uh-huh. about it. I'm like, yes, you must do this. It's got to be a very special video and we have to do it like 100%. You can't mm-hmm. just do it like halfway. We got to commit and like actually make a movie about Michael <laughs> trying to make <laughs> an essence from the screenplay video. So, and I think uh, we did it. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of the end of last year was happening. It was clear that we were going to hit a million subscribers soon. It was like, okay, I think this is the perfect time People are familiar with the channel, and I think we have all the resources, and we can tackle it. And so that's what we did. So that's how we ended up with our adaptation video. And part of what was fun about making the video was getting to revisit the movie adaptation, which I haven't seen in a long time, Mm -hmm. and just remembering the mind trip that it is (laughs) watching (laughs) that movie. And uh, yeah, there's just so many things to talk about with it. Yeah, I hadn't seen it in a while either, and I really, really just loved it the second time i think i've only seen it once and when he gets to that midpoint moment where he Mm -hmm. realizes the only thing he's qualified to write about is himself and it cuts to him talking to the recorder and describing what you've already seen in the movie it's just it's like that's what i live for going to (laughs) movies i think is it doesn't have to be meta but like that midpoint moment or that twist where Mm -hmm. it's just like this movie is giving me so much more than i even signed up for right and it's just going to keep giving me things i didn't even know i wanted and adaptation does that in spades so Mm -hmm. it's just such an enjoyable movie so good (laughs) i actually like i did not like this movie the first time i saw it i saw it it was assigned to me for a class in film school Mm -hmm. i think had like very unclear expectations or or how could you have like expectations but at that point I hadn't seen being John Malkovich and so you kind of it's not required reading to enjoy adaptation by any stretch but it definitely will like inform your viewing of adaptation if you've seen it and so I think that was a big part of it for me where I was just like this is completely insane (laughs) and like couldn't find my footing in it but it's like watching it again I agree with you like getting to revisit it is like if you haven't watched it lately, just go and watch it like as soon as you possibly can. <laughs> right, it's yeah. so good. Because I agree, I d- I did not like it the first time. Oh yeah, I remember seeing the trailer and like loving the trailer for it, and then the actual movie is just like, wait, what? This is not what I was expecting. Yeah, but yeah. I think on a repeated viewing, once you get it, it just it's so rewarding to watch it again. I saw it in the theater uh, with a good friend and a girlfriend at the time, and I loved uh, being John Malkovich. It's still one of my favorite movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I had a good, like I knew who Kaufman was at this point. And, um, I just remember leaving the theater being like, that was cool. <laughs> like, and, and then, uh, my, my girlfriend at the time who disclaimer, very intelligent person, I'm not, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but she was like, it was such a beautiful movie until it turned into just kind of a corny, like oh. action movie. And I was <laughs> like, that, that, that's the, what? <laughs> <laughs> And if you haven't, like, if you're talking to somebody who hasn't seen it, it's also one of those movies that's, like, hard slash impossible to explain. Right. Where you're just like, it's Charlie Kaufman. And they're like, I don't know who that is. And you're like, nope, but it's... And then he's playing his own brother. And, like, then it's about the fact that, like, he's writing the movie. And it's just, you get into the weeds with somebody who isn't, like, sort of a, a screenwriter, to be honest. I mean, right. um, 
it is so much about the writing process. Yeah. Um, and it's such a different take on the writing process and such an honest, like it feels like a Brutally confession. Brutally honest. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, the masturbation scene. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. it, he just goes all the way with it. Yeah. yeah. Not Seriously. a flattering portrayal of himself. It's, it's beautiful. Which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, of course. And I feel like it, it like rewards also having some knowledge of the industry, I think also. And like you're right. saying, Trisha, like knowing, having tried to write screenplays lets you appreciate the fact that Robert McKee is in it. Like mm-hmm. like that whole thing. <laughs> right. I think if you don't know who he is or no story by Robert McKee and blah, 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 like it's not the same kind of rewarding experience that it is when you know. Right. <laughs> it's just so great. I feel like there's, there's nobody better than Kaufman at, at kind of describing the like existential crises of the creative, neurotic, intellectual, which... For better or worse, I feel like we all identify with here. <laughs> um, so it's a very specific thing, but he just does it so well. I mean, it, it's it's who he is. And he's so honest about what it's like to be him that if you are anything like him, you know, from the opening credits where it's just Nick Cage's voice over black with his inner thoughts. It's like, yep, I identify with all <laughs> yeah. of these. Everything you're saying is a thought I am having. And yeah. As they get older, it only gets worse and yeah. more like that. Yeah. When I feel like he captures just like the the like human burden of being self-aware and like yes. too yes. smart yes. Mm-hmm. where like you know that you're doing something wrong <sighs> we're just but, too like... smart Michael <laughs> god <laughs> It's such a burden. I know, it's, it's the worst. <laughs> this weighty intellect, what a curse. <laughs> but the, there is an interesting like like issue with it where it's like you can be I don't want to say even smart enough as much as over analytical enough yeah. where mm-hmm. anything, any idea you might have, you can see all the way to the end of failure, to the point of failure. Mm-hmm. And you can see exactly. multiple points of failure. And then somebody who you might consider to be, you know, less intellectual or whatever, well, they're just going to go do it and it's going to get right. done, you know, and they're through doing it. It's sort of like the Zach character in the video, you know, not right. which again, it's like he just did stuff and saw what worked where meanwhile, like, you know, you're thinking so much about. So I think we've all experienced that. It's not necessarily about intelligence as much as just being too worried about everything. You know, yeah, which, that's a much better way to put it. Yeah, and and I I will say that that's why Michael and Zach were just so like innately perfect for this mm. meta movie about adaptation. <laughs> you know, movie about a movie about a movie because it. I mean, they literally are that in real life. <laughs> like. <laughs> Michael is the person that can see the points of failure down the road and is overthinking it all. And Zach will just, he literally does like live painting competitions where like, what? He just, it's like you just paint a painting live and like sell it at the end. That or something. stresses me out so much right. to even think about. But that's just like, that's how different right. sides of the polarity they are, which makes for just amazing chemistry and perfect, you know, thing. And he's super talented. Zach yeah. Brown, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Who played Zach my Brown. Brother. Yeah. So good. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's very similar to when you're a kid and you do things without thinking about them. Um, it, it has to do with like risk assessment, essentially, um, which when you're a kid is still developing in your brain. So you are not able to properly assess risk and therefore when you like are climbing a tree you don't think about like what even if I fall right and <laughs> yeah. even if you do fall like if, if that thought even crosses your mind it's still just like okay i might have like a broken bone or something it, it's never like oh i could die right right you don't have that like sense of mortality in the same way that mm. you do that develops as you get older which is a good thing uh like developing that sense of mortality it keeps us all from doing absolutely crazy things as we get older or most of us. Some people don't develop that. As well. <laughs> <laughs> but then, it, you know, so if you thought about, like, say, the last time you climbed a tree or like thinking about last time I was deciding I was going to try to climb a tree, you know, I'm like 30 years old and I'm trying to get up this tree and I'm just like, I'm going to die. Like, <laughs> right. and, and it actually limits your ability. Well, because some things you can only do with almost a brash sense of confidence, right. you know, right. like, like physically, even if you're overthinking every step of this tree climbing, you're going to do it worse exactly. than if you're kind of doing it by feel. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're not sort of intuiting your way through it. You're like overanalyzing it at every point. Yeah. And you're, again, yeah, got to be a worse tree climber and also probably more likely to fall. And then Which if the you just sort of part, yeah. scrambled up. Yeah. See, now, as a child that very early understood the risks of doing <laughs> things, <laughs> my counter argument would be rather than being a bad tree climber, 
You just know not to go in the tree where you could potentially fall, and then you're fine. But then you never climb any trees. I, I, just, picture, I just picture Michael's <laughs> mom going like, "Michael, honey, why don't you climb the tree?" And he's like, "Mom, listen." <laughs> right. I, I will present to you this, this list of why not. <laughs> I love it. I'm not that extreme. As you were thinking about that, I was thinking at so Alex and I went to UC Santa Cruz, and there was a very famous tree there called Tree Nine. I hope it's still there. Mm. I don't know if they cut. I feel it like down they cut not. off the like low lying branches oh, because so kids were like hurting themselves. Right. I mean, if you don't know what UC Santa Cruz is like, it's literally in a redwood forest, mm. um, which is amazing and beautiful. And there was a famous tree that had these long, low lying branches that made it very easy to climb. So mm. it was like the place to go to climb a big tree. Right. And people just climb up like this hundred foot tall tree. Like it was crazy. Whoa. But I remember that being a very important, stressful day when I made it like to the top. And you like, went all the way to the you top? Climbed so, it? Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I, I like, never I top, never did that. that. Mm. I was way more scared of falling off that tree. I feel like the other thing is that I do enjoy like weird physical challenges like climbing. So that would sometimes override the fear of free solo competi- Michael. Competitive right. wow. nature. Absolutely not free solo. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Adaptation does such a good job of funneling all that through the writing process. And I feel like the writing process is such an internal struggle that it, it's almost more intense or can be than I feel like something like climbing a tree, where mm-hmm. it's just like it's so arresting on an existential level that it's like, I feel like I'm a terrible person because right? I just know that the script is going to be bad and I can see it all the way. And like, why would I ever even thought of doing it? Like, he just captures that so well. That's the tr- tricky thing about you know any sort of creativity climbing a tree you understand what has to be done to get to the top right of the tree. right you may not want to do it but you know what the steps are you can you can see like the win scenario like, right this is when <laughs> right. it has been done and it is good writing yeah. is is you know anything you can write anything and it could be anything and it could be good and bad and somewhere that has to be in between and then goes somewhere else and who knows and the blank page like yeah. there's nothing quite as scary as someone who's done a lot of work in adaptation like it is really really hard when you do when you are handed a pro- an assignment like this that is an amazingly rich piece of source material and your job then is to like try to distill it into something that is like essentially has to be commercial and so the the scene where he's like talking about like I don't want characters learning life lessons I don't want like sex and guns and whatever um is so relatable because when you have that like sort of um burden of the author of the original piece of uh you know ip or whatever it's so much heavier because you're not just doing it for yourself you're not just like going to humiliate yourself potentially (laughs) but you're also going to possibly alienate like this other person writer that you really respect that i think is like one of the hardest parts and uh, i mean susan orling god bless her like (laughs) (laughs) i I was i think i read an imdb trivia or something that she at first was not okay with with this movie Mm -hmm. she they had to really convince her to sign off on it because i mean (laughs) i mean for obvious (laughs) reasons where it goes yeah (laughs) yeah but i think i read that too and I think she was encouraged by how unflattering Charlie Kaufman. Right. That like, was like the yeah. deciding factor was like, listen, I'm literally showing myself like jerk off instead of writing <laughs> yeah. this movie. Like that is <laughs> multiple like, times. Multiple, yeah. yeah. It's like a recurring pattern. Like, yeah. And then of course, like the prosthetics that make him look bigger, you know, yeah, like the right. receding hairline and all the sweat. And the all ridiculous the... amount of sweat in the Tilda Swinton scene. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. And Meryl Streep is going to play you, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Soften Even though by the end she's like doing, you know, or- orchid drugs with Chris Cooper. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's so bonkers and wonderful. When well, there's something, LaRoche about- is a fun character, though. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think? Um, yeah, there, there's something also interesting about that I relate to with his trying to adapt something, like you were saying, Trisha. This, this, I feel like books are allowed to be other things that movies aren't or mm. can't yes. be as easily and i think there is a frustration sometimes of like i have this really cool idea for this thing and i want to make it a movie but you kind of realize that like it can't be what a movie is like the conventional structure and the way a movie plays out like some things just don't work in that and that's a very frustrating thing and i think you can feel like it's you know you've taken this upon yourself and now you're letting yourself down and you're not good enough. And I feel like that the spiral that comes from that is also captured really, really well. And on, on the flip side, in some, in some ways, I feel and I haven't actually done an adaptation of a book or anything. So 
I have no uh -huh. idea what that's like. <laughs> but I feel equally horrified with the it's all coming from me mm. starting place of just like there's you know, I, I find directing and editing really enjoyable because it's like you're not the origin source of everything. Mm. You are taking and you know, it was really fun to take the adaptation script that Michael wrote and we all brainstormed. And great, I like this script. I think it's funny. I, I get what it's doing in every scene. Now my job is to figure out how to best portray that through the shots, through the acting, all that. But if it's just, I have to come up with something out of nothing, I have to shepherd it through the entire process until it is the perfect version of itself and ready to be made. Yeah. I, I don't know how to do that. Like I know how to take a script and like direct it, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah, writing is such a weird, lonely, almost just, overwhelming uh, predicament that you're in whereas there's a momentum when you're doing other mm -hmm. steps of the filmmaking process yeah. well, and that's why i like i why i also like those steps and editing especially i think is where i have the most fun because it's like i'm putting together like a puzzle and i have all the pieces all the pieces are there so it's just about how do i put it together to make like the finished product well and there's constraints because it's like they've already yeah. shot it i mean there might be reshoots but for the most part this is what you have to work with so now it's like how do you make this the best thing it can be right and that's once again it's like climbing the tree like i know what that looks like right there's a there's a point right. where it's like we've done all we can with this footage it's the best it's going to be right but when you're writing it could always be better how do you know when to stop like should it all be thrown out <laughs> trying to put the puzzle together while you're also designing the pieces for the puzzle right. without knowing what it's going to look like <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah well and and it is one of the things about screenwriting, it's a, it's such a unique um, storytelling format that is n absolutely, and I think we've talked about this before, but absolutely not translatable to any other kind of storytelling. It, there is not a one-to-one -one translation ratio from any other piece of material or source material. Um, you know, they say that like short stories are actually a little bit easier. Um, like mm -hmm. sort of the short format of a short story translates really well into a feature length script, which we see a lot. Like, I mean, sci-fi is jumping to mind for me. Like all of Philip K. Dick's stories have been mm -hmm. like movies right. now, you right. know? Right. And so like the struggle in terms of like that, trying to parse, okay, so what is um, thematically necessary? What is the feel, the tone, the what are the characters that are absolutely necessary and critical to telling the story? And then what sort of like doesn't fit into all of that? And that in itself, I mean, I can't imagine. I haven't actually read The Orchid Thief. Has anybody <laughs> at this table actually read it? I feel no. like they give a good impression of it within the movie itself sure. where you, yeah. you kind of get what it is, which is it's not a thing that should probably be a movie <laughs> right <laughs> it's not a narrative <laughs> right kind of a right which is a, of course like the essence of the struggle right um but yeah it, it, trying to like for example right now i am trying to adapt one of my own plays into a screenplay and it is i just feel so frustrated like <laughs> because it's fundamentally something different. So when you choose to tell a story, you also select the format. And ideally, those two things are a perfect match thematically, which I actually obviously really think adaptation the movie is. It is perfect it's for that. Perfect. Yeah. But, you know, you tell a story as a play because it is a play. You tell a story as a novel because it is a novel. Like in order to fully explore whatever it is that you're trying to explore or say whatever it is that you're trying to say as a writer, you choose the medium to be the perfect format for that. And how it it can be maddening trying to like make those two, like switch from one to the next and try to retain all of the essence of what it is that is so crucial sometimes you'll see a, a movie that was adapted from a play and it's a bunch of people sitting in rooms talking right uh, like proof i think is a good example Fences, yeah. really yeah and, and it's just like but you have this other medium if it's just gonna be the play then just do a play like why you have more you, area you can cover with this you know mm -hmm. yeah and that is always like really really challenging you know mm -hmm. um whether you're doing your own work like i am trying to do i i'm honestly maybe just gonna give it up and just be like we're doing a play now um <laughs> but yeah whether it, it is something that like y your own work or whatever it's still like that translation is the hardest part and so i really feel for charlie kaufman when, <laughs> i mean when i watch this movie just i can't imagine what well, I, I sorry i really identify with what you said about like 
an idea kind of knows what it wants to be. Mm. Or I don't know if you said it that way, but that's the way it should have been in my brain. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, I do think yeah, there are certain ideas where it's like, this is what it is. And so when you try to force it into a different box, mm -hmm. it fights you. Yeah. And you know, Michael and I ran into that kind of several years ago. We co-directed a web series and we're trying to figure out how to adapt it into like an hour long pilot to be able to pitch that pilot around. And it just wasn't working because the story we came up with was a pretty small scale story that kind of covered an arc of maybe a couple seasons of a web series. Right. It would be was... like a limited series that had right. a very clear end. And... But the way we were trying to figure out how to write a pilot was like, oh, it's got to be a pilot that could go on for, you know, go on for 10 seasons and mm. you know, set up a whole world and all these. And it was just the material didn't want to be that. And so we were fighting the idea, trying to make it something it wasn't. And it just doesn't work sometimes. So you, it's better to start from scratch at, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. One of the things I was thinking about when you were talking, Trish, is the, the relationship between theater and film I've always found really interesting. And my former roommate and really good friend, Scott Martin, um, was a theater director and directed a lot of theater. And so it was really fun. You know, we moved to L.A. together and he was like doing theater and I was doing film. And we would kind of have these like late night conversations about like what is like storytelling and what is mm -hmm. directing and the differences. And something that he, he said once that I've always remembered is like in theater, you know, you can have two actors sitting on black wooden cubes in a black space and be like, we're driving a car. And the yeah. audience is like, oh, yeah, OK, cool. We're driving a car. <laughs> I, I see them. They're driving a car. And as soon as you point a camera at them and you watch that footage, you're like, no, they're not, they're not driving. driving. They're just sitting in a black room. Like, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, and, and then even when you have the, the role behind them, if it's not done well, <laughs> even, right. even if you're like, no, there's scenery going behind them. But like, I can see that it's like green screen or whatever. Yeah. It's like you your brain suddenly like hyper focused is we're in theater it's just it's theater of the mind you're like sure you're in a car it's fine right. yeah and that's just it's always been an interesting dynamic to think about it's, i think theater activates or allows the imagination to be activated much more than yeah. film does which mm -hmm. just makes things very very literal right away well it's much more participatory like is set, you know, you're never going to have the same play two nights in a row or whatever because the audience is essentially participating in the storytelling process. And for me, the biggest difference, because I write a lot of both, um, the biggest difference is that in a play, you don't get to direct where the audience looks. So, like, you can present all kinds of different um, characters and points of view because the audience is literally viewing it from a myriad of different points in the audience and you don't get to control where they look. And so the, in film, I think that like you were saying, Alex, about the directorial process, uh, you are essentially interpreting. I mean, and, and this is the directorial like imperative anyway, is to interpret an already written piece of work, but you're interpreting it visually and you are stitching together what the audience is focusing on. That's essentially what right. you're directing in right. order to tell the story. But you don't get to do that in a play, which is both beautiful and also really, really, um, I think a lot of people who maybe come to screenwriting without starting in theater have trouble with the translation back the other direction, again, because they're fundamentally different media. Right. I mean, yeah, every time Scott would be like you should direct a play i'm like no i could never do that <laughs> like so much of how i think about movies is you know where is the camera what is it looking at like what is the information being conveyed at any given moment and that's just like that's the only kind of storytelling that i've spent time looking at and investing in and so to just yeah have people doing things and you can't control what anyone's looking at or like <laughs> right. do another yeah. take or like, like for this next scene, this and we do another put the audience behind the <laughs> right. everyone pause everyone get up out of your seats move to this part of the room and then we'll yeah. continue yeah. yeah well and speaking of directing though i mean adaptation spike jones is masterful here i just am so impressed at not just the way that the camera like moves or presents the information, um, but, you know, a huge part of the directorial process is working with the actors. And obviously we have some of the best performances from any of these actors. I mean, Nicolas Cage in this movie. Yeah. And oh. his brother. They're both great. <laughs> yes. right. And his brother. So, so, so good. Yeah. It's like it's too good. Like yeah. it, they're just so <laughs> good. And I yeah, I just feel like. My favorite scene that I would watch over and over again is the um, when like the brother comes in to pitch Charlie Kaufman uh, his idea for the his like thriller the thriller three. Yeah. Yeah, the three and it's like the three they're all the same character and just like 
<laughs> but how is he here and also trapped in a room? Uh, movie magic? No. How? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Trick trick photography. <laughs> yeah. Just like, and I think it's just amplified by the fact that it's the same actor playing both roles. Mm. But I just like each side of the performance feels so honest and real, and I get it and I buy it. It's just so. Right, you, you don't really think very much during the movie of like, oh, Nick Cage is playing both these guys. Yeah. Because they really do energetically feel different. Very different. Yeah. Nicholas Cage is one of those actors like Keanu Reeves where you're like, I think I know what to expect from you. And then every once in a while you're like, oh. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I was reading, I, I wa- actually watched an interview with Nick Cage about this movie. And he was saying that, um, sometimes people come up to him and tell him that they love Donald so much. And they're like, I love Donald. Donald's so relatable and amazing and fun. And he said, you know, I don't remember playing Donald actually. Like when I think back on this movie, he was so keyed into the Charlie character, you know, and he interviewed Charlie Kaufman, like hours and hours of tapes just, and he would have Charlie like act. He's like, how does it look like when you're angry? And Charlie's like, okay. And he would get angry <laughs> and stuff like that. Wow. Um, oh, I love and, it. And then, you know, Nick Cage loves to say, loves to say this, but he, Charlie asked him to destroy the tapes and Nick will say that he burned them. He <laughs> set them on fire. It's so dramatic. But yeah, he was saying that like, he doesn't really remember playing Donald. He was so focused on Charlie. And then he also would say, depending on how he like woke up that morning, like if he woke up like sort of happy and like feeling good on the right side of the bed, whatever, he would ask to do the Donald scenes first, the Donald side of nice. the scenes first. And Which is always what you up- want as a director for your actors. Like, Can we just not do hey, anything we were going to do? If they're, yeah. they're going to give me that performance, <laughs> yeah. I'll work yeah. with them. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, if he felt bad, he would do the Charlie se- side of the scene first or whatever. But it is like you you never get confused about who they are right. because Nick is so confident like in who they are. He never forgets who is who. He really, really knows who is who at every second. Like the, every bit of their physicality is different. And you're saying their energy is different. And so it's not in any way confusing. They look exactly the same, but it's They're amazing. Different people. Yeah. yeah. So like, why didn't Spike Jones and Charlie Coffin make more movies together after this? Because I just, I want I more, I want more of this pairing. Like, I, I feel like it's one of those combos where nothing from Charlie Kaufman's script is missed by Spike Jones. Mm-hmm. Like, every layer of subtle comedy is done to the perfect degree. Like, Maggie Jolen Hall in that yes. scene where she's yeah. having breakfast with him, <laughs> the way she's like, see, I knew he would like it. Like, you know, like <laughs> having a little celebration. Like, yeah. every one of those little subtle beats is played so perfectly by everybody involved. They were, they were going to make uh, someone, uh, Amy Pascal, I think, had said, you guys should make a horror movie together. And then Charlie Coffin started writing this, like, movie that was, like, scary, not um, so much as a traditional horror, but more just, like, it's about death and it's about, like, things that are scary. Um, and Spike was going to direct it and that sort of slowly 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 became synecdoche new york mm-hmm. but by the time it actually was gonna it was ready to be made uh spike was committed to where the wild things are oh, and then charlie directed it and then since then he's been directing his own stuff so it's like it's not that they necessarily aren't doing things together as much as charlie sort of like is like i know how to direct a movie now so i'm gonna go do that but i agree i would like to <laughs> it's like yeah i prefer the combo personally <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it was interesting reading this the script of adaptation and seeing what what had changed and like Mm. what got kind of rearranged and you know the whole like you were saying Alex the opening monologue where you're just hearing Nicolas Cage like speak like that wasn't in the draft that I read anyway I think part of that combo and what makes it strong is that he's able to take the Charlie Kaufman this is what I wrote down and it's insane and translate it into a very like enjoyable movie right because Charlie Kaufman scripts are like almost unhinged to read. So, you know, I remember <laughs> reading, it, reading Eternal Sunshine. Yeah. I'm like, where's the grammar? What's happening? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. the thing about Eternal Sunshine is you look at it and it's whole chunks of like just pages and pages of just dialogue and no action lines about what you're looking at whatsoever. And so that's all Michel Gondry. He was just like, what if we shoot it here and we shoot it there and we cut back and forth because so little of that was in the Kaufman screenplay. Yeah, I feel like that's why he's done. He did two with Michel Gondry, right? Mm -hmm. And two with Spike Jones. I feel like you need that sort of really strong visionary, like visual director, somebody like those guys to work with Kaufman if if he's not going to do it himself, you know? It's kind of like the Fincher Sorkin thing that I loved about the social network also, mm. where Sorkin just writes right. pages of dialogue. Right. And it's like Fincher's like, okay, I, I will shoot this. <laughs> I will put all the things on screen. Yeah. There, there are certain people where it's almost like they're 
as much as it sucks to say, their best work is when someone kind of reins it in a little. You know, right? Terry Gilliam right. is one of those people where it's like if you let him do his own thing, it becomes just like <laughs> whatever. But then when the studio kind of steps in a little, you know, if they step in too much, you get the Brazil 90 minute happy ending cut. But they step yeah. in a little and be like, what if we sort of turn this a little bit more into a movie? Then you get something that feels a little tighter, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about Kaufman is he actually in real life does sort of rail against structure and formula and that kind of thing, which cutely uh, John York and Into the Woods like is like, yeah, but here's the entire act breakdown of being right. John Malkovich. You know, he's like, he says this, but then he actually does it in his movies, which of course is exactly what adaptation is. Um, but you get the sense that he's not against structure as much as he, he's against just being conventional and being boring and that kind of thing. You know, he's, he's like, if you're too conventional, then every movie becomes the same and it's boring and blah, blah, blah. But then you have, you ever see Gus Van Sant's uh, Death Trilogy, Elephant and Jerry and uh, Last Days? Yes. An elephant. Yeah. elephant. Yeah. I hate those movies <laughs> <laughs> because they're just so nothing. Like there's just, here's some stuff and then suddenly there's credits and you're like, I guess that was the movie, you know? And then obviously, so it's like on one end of the spectrum, you have that and the other end you have, you know, every superhero movie or whatever like just kind of boring so you can see the beats coming right like a mile away and so it's i think like, the, here here we are now yeah the big thing for him is just sort of finding that irreverent but not completely chaotic kind of thing you know he said there was a reviewer who said uh Kaufman would either jump off a bridge than write a conventional romantic comedy when he wrote Eternal Sunshine. And he's like, if I had written a conventional romantic comedy, imagine what that reviewer would have. He's like, he would have torn me a new one if I had just like done a normal thing. But I like that. I like that art is ever changing. It's like once, yes. you know, we, uh, we talked about this before a little. Once you know what to expect, then you have to figure out what's the next mm -hmm. step and where can we go. And where right. that balance between the two is always kind of moving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that's, you know, listening to you talk, I, I go back to film school, Michael, a lot. And I feel like that's a time when for a lot of people, or at least for me, it was like, okay, I, I loved movies. I loved all movies in high school and I'm just making things. And then in film school, you kind of like start to learn stuff and you kind of learn what conventions are. And then you kind of start to be like, well, I don't want to do that. Like I want to break yeah. conventions. Like I'm going to be something new and original. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, screenwriting books are dumb. I'm not going to learn any of the fundamentals. I don't need that. And there's... <laughs> And I think the end of uh, my last year in college, I made a, a film that was almost like my version of adaptation where it was just like I was trying to figure out I want to write a movie, but I don't want it to like make sense or have to do any of the <laughs> yeah. things. So I'm just going to write nonsense. And then like, like the Nick Cage monologue, basically. Yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah. like literally by the end, I'd written myself into it and I'm like talking to my characters and they're like, <laughs> like, why don't you just make it like a thing that is enjoyable? Like maybe that's OK. And so I feel like that's another reason why adaptation has always resonated with me because I very much went through that phase of like okay like conventions are bad so let's try to do something else but when you do something else like you just feel like you're going crazy and there's nothing to ground you and so that's probably a big impetus for how like why I started the channel also is like to go back to those fundamentals and like okay what are the important parts of conventions that are required for it to be a thing learn those and then like do something fun with it right and adaptation is such a great example of that where it's like it follows the conventions but it's completely unique and its own thing right something you've never seen before right yeah if you've seen our video on adaptation then you know that i'm a big fan of audible and you've also seen my fictitious brother zach come to appreciate them as well if you've never tried audible now is a great time to start because audible members get more now than ever before Members choose three titles every month, one audiobook plus two Audible originals that you can't hear anywhere else. Audible delivers bestsellers, business, self-improvement, memoirs, and more, all professionally narrated by actors, authors, and motivational superstars like Rachel Hollis, David Goggins, and Mel Robbins. And Audible members can also get free access to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post delivered daily to the Audible app. They offer free and easy audiobook exchanges, credits you can roll over for a year, and a library you keep forever, even if you cancel. So start listening with a 30-day Audible trial, and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. Just visit audible.com slash screenplay, or text screenplay to 500-500. If you're looking for a book recommendation, in the next podcast episode, we examine the first video I ever made for the channel on Gone Girl. 
so you can download the audiobook for Gone Girl for free today and be ready to follow along with our discussions on how the book was adapted to the film. So once again, visit audible.com slash screenplay or text screenplay to 500-500 to get started. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring this episode of Beyond the Screenplay. I remember my uh, 11th grade English teacher, Mr. Bliss, who was, he was that one teacher that you have who like kind of makes you think about things. And the first day I was wearing khakis and like a t-shirt kind of dressed like pretty normal, mm-hmm. but I was the kid in high school who often didn't dress like that, you know, the <laughs> nail polish and the black leather pants and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> awesome. And the black eyeliner. Black leather you know. pants. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Wow. So then on the first day he was talking about conformity. He's like, I'm looking around the room. You guys all look pretty conformist, you know, and everyone kind of looked at me a little and, <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, oh, I could come in tomorrow wearing something very nonconformist. He's like, yeah, but if you did that simply to prove a point, then you'd be conforming. And my mind went. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so it's like that weird thing of like, right. if you try not to be conventional too hard, then you're doing the same. You might as well be doing conventional. It's like just and Charlie Kaufman. He talks a lot about the truth. He's like, look, right. I just want to find the truth here. Right. I'm not trying to make something that is one way or another. I'm trying to make the thing that feels like it's supposed to be, you know. And for him, that you know, having listened to a few different interviews with him and read a lot about him, for him, I think that resides in its honesty. Like, yeah. not so much truth with a capital T, necessarily. I don't feel like he's trying to say something about life oh, or no, yeah. politics or, like, anything like that. He's just trying to say something honest about himself and the world in the way that he experiences it. Um, and it's, it's just so beautiful the way that this movie is so human and like absolutely you know we we've talked about how unflattering it is and how just absolutely brutal the portrayal of the characters are they absolutely not trying to look good um and trying to say something about themselves but from a place of true love and curiosity for humans and all of our sort of like foibles yeah i mean his character is especially himself in this movie are just so flawed and human in the most endearing way. Yes. You know, like you, you, you hurt so bad when he like makes the mistake with that waitress mm-hmm. kind of trying like assuming, she, yeah. assuming yeah. she's like super into him, but then he like goes way too far and offers to like take her up to Santa Barbara. And she's like, I'm going to go talk to my manager now. Yeah. <laughs> just, and you just, he just captures those like horrible, embarrassing moments. So, empathetically it's it's few movies do that as well as his do well nick cage has said that that scene he finds particularly painful to watch like he it hurts yes it hurts is humiliated when he watches that scene (laughs) which is just like oh my god but even la roche too like la roche is so i mean he comes across as this like crazy eccentric and whatever but then when you hear that story about what happened to his two front teeth and um you know losing his mother and it's heartbreaking and you really start to understand because obviously writing a romance between Susan Orlean and LaRoche is a bold choice. <laughs> Charlie <Kaufman. laughs> yeah, right. uh, but you, you buy it for that reason, that intimacy that develops between them and you see how profoundly sad she is and, and how like sort of broken he is as well and why he does what he does. And you kind of buy it and you like, they're not, good people per se I, I don't think the film moralizes them either one way but or the sympathetic other sympathetic to a degree but yeah, yeah. They, they are and you kind of like want them to be happy and you're just kind of like maybe they can be together <laughs> you know <laughs> if it weren't for alligators oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is always kind of the i think it's it's the most fun for me to think about the charlie kaufman storyline in mm-hmm. adaptation and you if, forget there's like actually another movie <laughs> right a whole other movie that's and probably like, most of the runtime actually and yeah. like I, I definitely don't enjoy that story as much as the charlie kaufman story like it sometimes I'm, oh, i wish it was cut down a little bit just mm. to get back to nick cage and back to that you know primary story um who, as much who, as i love meryl streep right whoever thought like anyone would ever be like can we get away from meryl streep and get back to nicholas cage like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> because <laughs> they they do go into a lot of detail in the whole orchid thief story mm. and it's it's like i don't know if i need this much of this story I, you know i just need the the basics and, and i love meryl streep's character and she's also another exploration of a different side of that new york intellectual mm-hmm. like, here we all are being very smart together but are we just kind of lifeless and loveless i and love soulless? the scene with her and her like other like intellectual friends mm-hmm. yeah like 
like kind of ripping apart LaRoche and being like, oh, like, oh, he's such a fun character. Oh, it's so ridiculous. And it's, mm. it, it <laughs> I feel like I've been around people like that. And I, I don't like it when people are judgy of other people. And there's, I feel like somehow in that scene, it's conveyed in a way where it's like, I just feel sad for all those people. And it's just right. like, it's, it's really like, like what are, what's the meaning in their lives? Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Like their meaning is, trying to take down this other person that it's already like a had tragedy. Yeah. There's a lot of layers happening there. Well, and I think that comes back to what I was saying about curiosity, because I feel like a, that essentially curiosity is a loving response mm. um, where you can, if you're looking at someone and trying to understand them instead of passing judgment on whatever it is they're saying to you or like you were saying passing judgment or trying to pick somebody apart and which is of course is always just about whoever is doing the judging right trying right. to make themselves feel better and their insecurities and whatever exactly. curiosity if you're looking at someone and instead asking well why and wondering about this person and wondering about their humanity and their story I feel like you end up at a place, it's a loving place and it's a place that this movie like invites us into particularly. It invites us into because Susan Orlean as a character is positioned to be curious about LaRoche. She has to be, that's her job. So she goes down there and she starts asking questions. And so this idea that asking questions about a person or about experiences and asking questions about life is sort of what humanizes us. And that's why this movie doesn't feel mean spirited in as like mm -hmm, sort yeah. of grotesque as the characters can be. It still feels really warm, even when it gets like a little outlandish, you know, <laughs> it feels really warm and yeah, we relate to it so hard. Like Charlie Kaufman's so lovable right. as a character, <laughs> right? you know? Even if you just like, if you read a list of the things that he does in a movie, you would not be like, this is, <laughs> This, this is, is not person. describing someone that I have warm feelings toward in this right. moment. Exactly. Yeah. And his brother's death scene is always... I was... I, I'd kind of forgotten that mm. there was so much emotion behind that and that, like, his brother gets to, like, teach this very, like, deep <laughs> yeah. life lesson. Uh, <laughs> you are what you love, not what loves you. Yeah. Because in the back of your mind, you're also giggling. You're also right. going, oh, there was deus ex machina, like he said, and this right. character who's dying is not a real person, you know? But also, like, if you're focused on the world of the movie you're like oh but this is actually a very sweet scene with like some like a little bit of like philosophy in it and and they never wink at the camera they never right. ever they like, break straight. the reality that the characters are occupying right. which we talked about when we were working on the adaptation video that we wanted to shoot we were like how self-aware do we want to be how like much do we want to nod or wink at the audience and it was a really good call i think michael on your part where it was just like not at all Right, because there, there was a period where, if you want to say, I start talking about the yeah. adaptation video that we made. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were thinking about, oh, the, we want to build in these lessons from the screenplay lessons into the actual short as it's happening. Mm -hmm. And do we want that to kind of go into lessons from the screenplay mode when those lessons are occurring? So it's like, wink, wink, here's the graphics, here's the things you're used to. And now we'll go back to movie mode. And Michael had a really strong vision uh, no, we're gonna once we go into movie mode, we stay in movie mode, and I, I think you're right. I think it did work. Yeah, we had uh, be back in January, the four of us and our producer Vince, and yeah. our 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 guy, yeah, our guy, the, Vince. The guy our, our guru, he, Vince, the guy behind the guy. <laughs> um, the five of us got together, and we just like came up with just such a long list of ideas for what this thing could be. Is it going to start as a short film that then turns into an LFTS video, or is it going to be the other way around? And uh, and of course, I pitched a lot of like the zanier things of like, <laughs> and then Michael looks into the camera and says, Audible, you can get it on Audible, <laughs> you know, and uh, I really wanted the space balls moment where as you guys are editing the video, you see footage of yourselves editing the video. <laughs> like, when mm -hmm. is this? This is now. And then you turn and you wave <laughs> and the camera's behind you also. <laughs> and uh, I think it was a good call that we kept it, you know, but I just like my, my sort of zany brain just like started going, getting really excited. During There's so many this. possibilities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a hard call to make because like those things would also undeniably be fun. Like, so it's, it requires a lot of discipline to be like, yes, this would be funny and enjoyable, but it's like breaking the bigger thing that we're trying to construct. So we have to not do the fun thing 
at like all these different turns. And it was very interesting process writing the whole thing. That's exactly what I was going to ask about. Talk to us about writing the script, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So it was so we had our meeting, the five of us, where we broke down kind of just mapped out the major beats of a short film of like inciting incident desire like what does michael want and like where does he end up what's the climax and it was really weird talking about myself so it's not me but it's the character and yeah um but i feel like that's kind of where we arrived at like the zach reacts video because you know it, it helped to have adaptation as a template yeah. to compare to the whole time and so it's I have this friend, Zach Brown, and he looks very similar to me. So I was like, okay, of course there has to be a brother character. So how can we use that? Um, so we kind of, yeah, we threw out a lot of ideas. And then uh, like a month later and kind of end of February, first week of March, maybe, uh, Alex and I kind of went through the outline again and refined it while walking through Ikea. I was trying to buy. <laughs> oh, that's right. That was like, I'm going to make a standing desk and you need to buy some other stuff. So right. There was a lot. Of I guess I guess we'll do our writing meeting at Ikea. Right. That's so so there's a lot of walking and talking. Um, it's aggressively adorable. It is. <laughs> but yeah, so and that's kind of where we honed in on the theme because the kind of the big challenge is what is the thing that Michael's trying to do that uh, can be bought as a lesson that he still needs to learn because mm -hmm. in this world lessons from the screenplay exists so it's like <laughs> he can't be like he's never written anything before uh but that is a, a lesson that's universal and useful to people and so we kind of arrived that like you know michael's flaws that he's trying to be too perfect and uh procrastinating because he's trying to figure out the best thing to do but he can't doesn't know what it is so he's just going to procrastinate and ultimately he needs to learn to just start writing um, so once mm -hmm. we can, <laughs> <laughs> I like that you're discussing this as though it's completely an affectation right. or just so, so separate. A, to from a, made, you. a totally made up story. Totally, yeah, totally made, made up, up story. <laughs> it also helped that we had the medium of YouTube where lessons from the screenplay exists on this one, not the end of the spectrum necessarily, but this one end of YouTube that's more you know, uh, crisp and educational and mature. And then there is this other end of YouTube that's sort mm -hmm. of what inspired Zach reacts of, you know, so it was like we could use, we could use the medium of lessons from the screenplay as sort of its own character or setting of the video itself. And I think that was fun because we started talking about, we had a lot of talks about what would Zach's YouTube channel be, you know, because right. there's so much, so much stuff to choose from <laughs> out there on YouTube. Well, I think what worked so well about the video was it really was an adaptation of, mm. <laughs> I, there, that was not my intent. It was an adaptation of like the movie studio split of like, I want to make a sprawling, uh, moody, orchid thief mm -hmm. art film versus the three, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> right. it's like, what's, right. The, what's the YouTube version of that? It's like, the perfect video essay versus I'm going to walk around the block and like yell into a camera yeah. right. um, so. <laughs> and eat fire hydrants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was, I feel like yeah, once we figured out that that was my journey and, you know, figured out Zach's channel, it was like the perfect, like you're saying, Alex, the inverse of like, if I'm trying to like plan and be super meticulous, Zach's thing is that he doesn't think at all. He just goes for it and like just starts doing things. Um, and so once we had that breakdown, it was actually the script came out pretty quickly. And I think part of that is getting to write myself. And, yeah. you know, it, I think it's useful that adaptation features voiceover so much because I wouldn't normally go to voiceover. But voiceover is very useful yeah. to just be like, this is what the character's thinking right now. Right. And I know exactly what that character's thinking in this moment because that character is me. It's one of the best moments in adaptation when McKee. McKee's McKee, like, right. yeah, God help you if you use voiceover or something like that. Yeah. In the middle of his voiceover. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. I wanted to try to find a way to work that joke in here, but couldn't quite figure out. Where well, it. did you guys ever, as I said, you should reach out to Robert McKee or Brian Cox to be in the video? <laughs> we didn't. We failed to. Yeah. You guys that. are so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> had a limited time to work with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Cause the, the writing of the script happened like the first week of March basically, but it, it came out really quickly. And, and Trisha, what you were saying earlier about Nicolas Cage feeling like he didn't even like remember playing the brother character. Mm -hmm. I feel like I had a similar thing where like- You didn't play the brother character. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I really don't Guys, remember Michael's it losing then. it. <laughs> <laughs> but- <in a, laughs> Definitely was worried about your sanity during some parts of this process. I mean, it was a pretty Super clear. dizzying yeah. thing to be like sitting and writing the video and trying to write the scene where I'm trying to figure out how to write the video 
that I'm trying to write the like yeah, yeah. Well, about re- about a movie that's about a guy trying to figure out how to write the movie right and I remember in the workspace the night that you were going to hit a million we were all in the workspace like watching the counter climb but at that time you were also writing the script <laughs> right. about how you're about to hit a million subscribers it's just like I was all kinds of tripped out. It was so surreal. <laughs> it was very the surreal. universe folding in on itself. Seriously. Yeah. Just to finish my thought about what I meant by so me relating to Nicolas Cage not remember playing the brother right, character. Right. Oh, right. <laughs> Writing the brother character was like the easiest part for me, actually. Mm. And so for me, I think it was because, you know, I know me and I know those thoughts and I was so tuned into like what is Michael's character experiencing right now that it was actually really easy to just like flip the switch and be like, what's the opposite of like, what is the thing that would most annoy me? (laughs) And I know exactly what it is. And here it goes. And so it was like the Zach character felt very effortless, whereas like the thoughts that Michael is having felt like it required a lot more thinking. It's so meta. It's yeah, exhausting. It's exhausting. But it must have been a little relaxing, at least, to be able to separate and be like, "This is the character of Michael." For sure, you know, yes, yeah. because obviously, it's like we took him to, at least in the pitching and everything, we took him to places that were not right. Mike, not real life Michael. It was here's the the movie version. One of my favorite things about the movie is how kind of mean you are, <laughs> because Michael's one of the nicest people we all right. know, and I think it's just in the same way that. Charlie Kaufman is brutal with himself. It was just, it was fun to see you do this kind of cartoonishly uh, irritated version of yourself uh, with Zach. And another thing I learned from directing this short was just how how well it works, duh, to have two <laughs> characters put together that are exact opposites. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it's so much an obvious screenwriting lesson, but I so rarely push characters that far for some reason. It's like, well. I want to be realistic. So they're, they're going to be both like normal people who are just a little bit off. But no, just go all the way. Like have them be mm-hmm. complete opposites. And how much fun is that to watch? Every single scene was so much fun to direct and to edit because the energy was so clashing between the two of you. When, when Zach told me his character was based on Mr. Peanut Butter from BoJack Horseman, <laughs> I was happy. I smiled for three days. <laughs> that was a good choice by him to, to base yeah, it. I, yeah, you know, I, I love... Um, collateral fight club for se- first uh, season of true detective you know it's like take these two characters who are polar opposites put them in a room together and see what happens you know i think that that's it's fun to watch yeah and i think sometimes the what seems daunting about that is like well if they're opposites like then why are they still in the room together right. like how are they right. like on the same journey together but yeah i feel like it just takes some thinking and doing and and it, it was also fun that in our short you know, we're doing the John Truby thing of like the protagonist and the antagonist are like both after the same thing. Like they're both trying to make a YouTube channel mm-hmm. and be right. successful, but it's just the way they're doing about it are different and different takes on exploring the theme, which happens through dialogue, which we <laughs> say in dialogue. <laughs> God. Um, yeah, it was, it was an absolute trip yeah. to write this well, thing. And I think too, like one of the smartest things that you could have done, which, you know, Adaptation, again, provides a template. The movie adaptation provides a template for for the video that we created. But one of the smartest things that you did is really contain it. What you were saying just now about like, so why are these two characters still together if they if they believe so such opposite things about the world and the them being twins in the movie um, really does that in adaptation because you can't get rid of your brother. You mm-hmm. can't get rid of your twin brother, no matter how different you are. And so that really by adapting or by borrowing that Mm -hmm. from adaptation, (laughs) it it creates the same containment. But also you guys just shot it in this very apartment where we are now recording (laughs) this podcast, which is your real apartment. Right. And obviously there are like budgetary issues and time constraints and all of that stuff. So operating within that like box essentially, but it does also really keep the story focused and it, is a marvel of containment where the conflict then is all just intercharacter conflict. Um, it's really works really well. And something that really surprised me when it all kind of came together and we cut it together was it was like, wow, I'm actually feeling a little emotional by the end of this mm-hmm. movie. Like, when you have the apology scene with Zach, it's like we've been, been on a real journey with these two. <laughs> this is really this is really something. Which I was surprised about, you know, because I went into it, my expectations being, was I'm going to do the best job I can directing this. And the, you know, the end goal is that it's just a really mind-blowing, fun, surprise video for your fans. And so when it 
came together. I think it's a testament to the writing, to you and Zach and your chemistry. Just, it was like, wow, this actually was a journey that I enjoyed going on. It was, yeah, it surpassed my expectations. It was such a pleasure watching you guys work also. Like yeah. Alex, especially like directing. It was like you were, you're not afraid to have fun, but you also knew we were on a time, you know, and you, you had your visions and you were happy to try different things and everything and it was just like everybody who the crew and everybody was just really professional and i was really glad i could like be here for a day on it yeah so. it was one of the most pleasant film yeah. like short film shoots i've and i've been on so many uh, <laughs> uh, short film shoots i've ever been on um and i think part of that is obviously you and alex are really good friends and know each other really well zach's a good friend we all of us here work <laughs> together quite a bit. So there's a lot of rapport going and also a, a singularity of vision. Um, we knew what we wanted this movie to be. You knew what you wanted this short film to be. And, you know, Alex, you marvelously helped to bring it to life. But yeah, how do you, um, when you watch it now, Michael, how do you feel about your acting? <laughs> uh, I feel like I just kind of disengage. Like I think part of, so I'm I'm not an actor. Uh, <laughs> But I've acted in like friends shorts, like in high school, and like I've directed a lot of actors and been on set a lot. So like, I've, and a lot of my friends are actors. So I I felt like I had gleaned enough, or like through osmosis, felt like I could maybe pull it out to pull myself annoyed at Zach off, like, mm -hmm. like that <laughs> that narrow strip of performance. I felt I could probably do. Um, but I feel like doing the channel. One of the things I had to get over first was having to listen to my voice over and over again mm -hmm. and so i think you, i just kind of like disassociate where it's just like okay i mean that's my voice i know that intellectually but right now i'm just editing this voice and then as i've had to do the like end video things where i'm on screen for a little bit i've kind of had to like okay that's what i look like that's what it sounds like it's fine i'm gonna disassociate i can't do anything about it that's that's what it is um so i feel like for the most part when i'm watching it i don't feel like oh i'm watching myself do all these things it's just like i'm watching the images happen except for mm. the apology scene with zach was i think that's the one scene i don't like watching because that's like the most like dramatic yeah. scene well, and i feel actory. like right that's mm. the only time that i'm like i'm trying to act here yeah. and like i can see it and i know that i'm not doing it and it's painful so that was I had to edit that scene too, and that was pretty rough. Mm. <laughs> I, I mean, think I will, the final cut we got of that scene, yeah, you, you play well in it. I'll, I'll say I, I am very sensitive to what I call bad acting things, you know, because I studied it and I watch for it a lot, and I can tell when someone doesn't know what they're doing. And like, I was expecting a little bit of that, you know, like sort of like an acceptable amount where you're like, oh, it's a YouTuber like doing a thing, and I didn't see any of it. Like, so I was really impressed. It was Thank really, you. it was really fun. I actually got to do a little bit of voice acting myself on the set because so all the scenes of Michael's voiceover, he has to act. Oh yeah, I got to play it too. You got to do it <laughs> yeah. too? Isn't you guys, that fun? Yeah. You guys both got to be different versions of Michael's interior <laughs> monologue. Right. We're like his shoulder angels <laughs> and like, which yeah. I feel like we are in real life because we, you know, we provide feedback for Michael's scripts. So <laughs> and it was like which one is the devil is what, what I don't know. It's probably Let's me. Let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> it was, that was super helpful. I feel like that was the other thing that was nice about this script is that there wasn't a whole lot of dialogue for me mm -hmm. to say like speaking and acting is very hard is what i've learned but like sitting <laughs> uh on the ground and i'm just like okay i've been tired i've been stressed out before so i can like think that and then literally trisha or brian is there narrating the thoughts in my head that's if you if you're gonna act that's how i would do it if you're so, gonna write something for yourself so it was like michael like, reacts <laughs> no <Damn it. laughs> well actually in adaptation Nicolas Cage, they would like whatever side that he had just done, you know, so he would start off doing either Donald or Charlie, and then they would get the audio from that mm, and they'd put it in like, like oh, an nice. earphone for him basically so he could act with himself the other half of the scene. That's great. Yeah. And so he essentially was acting like off of his own performance, you mm -hmm. know, and just looking at like a little marker for an eyeliner or whatever. That's probably what Nicolas Cage's brain is like. <laughs> <laughs> He just hears like another version of himself talking from somewhere. Well, and that's what was also great about having Zach Brown there. Like Zach is 
as Alex said, like that's just who Zach is, like turned up a notch for sure. But yeah. like that is his energy. Mm. That is our dynamic when we get into that. <laughs> and yeah. I've directed Zach a lot. So I think it was fun for him to just like, like I'm on his level now. And like his role is to annoy me as much as possible in every single scene. Yeah. So it was, it was very easy to just <laughs> react to Zach. Yeah. I mean, Zach, which is such a pleasure to work with because yes, he just got great. the greatest energy and he takes directions so well he's he really you know he's he's a pro he knows what he's doing so i can just tell him i can give him bad direction and he like translates it and makes it good so that was just so much fun and i think it really was a good choice to do that versus you having to act against an imaginary self like the right. energy would be so different if it was you trying to play both roles yeah so that was a really smart choice it was really interesting being on the acting side you know for the first time in depth and kind of understanding so much more like I've, I've always appreciated how hard acting is but I think <laughs> having to walk around in it for four days it, it's uh makes me appreciate it that much more and and just seeing you know as a director there are times where you're like we're just trying to get this close-up shot and like why are the actors like laughing about like how weird this is and how it doesn't feel natural and like just it doesn't matter it looks good on camera like what's the problem this is like the internal <laughs> monologue that you're having <laughs> and i remember distinctly the scene where i'm lying on the ground looking at uh my iphone and having that moment of like this is my magnum opus to get the shot i had to hold the phone in the most ridiculous place ever and i couldn't get over how absurd it felt to be like <laughs> right. this is so not how anyone would do this i can't imagine that this looks good but everyone's telling me it's fine so i just have to do it right it's like trust us like tilt your head like two degrees this way move the iphone out of your actual eye line and hold it here where you can't see it but look right. like you're looking at it and, right yeah. <laughs> so just even just little things like that it was great to kind of get the experience from the other side and understand why those reactions happen and maybe how to cut them off or address them more any other acting lessons that you took away from doing um, it? There was a lot. It's hard to kind of remember now because we've been out of that mode. But I, I think I understood the importance of brevity. And that's something Alex and I have talked about as directors, that when you're trying to explain something to an actor and you're trying to make adjustments, it's easy to kind of overcorrect and try to over explain to be like, like, I really am trying to like make this as clear as possible. So I'm going to say all these things. And I found that Many times when I was in the scene and we were between takes getting direction, I felt like the more information I received, the more like confused I got. And like, I just wanted a little bit. It's like, <laughs> there's already a bunch of stuff in my head. Like, so like, Michael, I'm going to share all the thoughts that are in my head in real time <laughs> so you can understand me the best. <laughs> I guess and it's not always the best. Sometimes choice. that yeah. was <laughs> obstructive, but but sometimes <laughs> it was also helpful. So I don't know. Right. I, basically acting is hard. Right. Is yeah. the thing that I've. Yeah. And it's, it's and it's a good it's something I do want to work on as a director too is is I'm a very pro verbal person I think is like the psychological word for it um, where I my thoughts become clearest as I speak them whereas if I keep them in my head they actually get more confusing so I need to find a way to protect my actors from that uh, when they only want to hear the little, the core truth of the thing they need and not. All the steps in my head to get to that core truth because that could be a bit overwhelming and the other lesson i'll just say is that i many times have worked with actors who like we do a take and they're like oh, i didn't feel that like i was not experiencing that right at all and i was like no that was the best one yeah they're like what are you talking about and like that i wasn't in it at all it didn't make any sense i wasn't in the moment it's like doesn't matter it looked really good on camera and it worked out and it feels like they never feel satisfied <laughs> with that explanation and so then I kind of experienced that where like, you know, in that Zach scene where I'm trying to like apologize, like I was trying to like go to these emotional places and like I would watch the take back where like in the moment I felt like I was really experiencing this and really wanting him to like forgive me and all these things. And then I'd watch the take back and I'd be like, my face didn't move at all. <laughs> like I'm not yeah. emoting anything. Uh, and That so was one thing I did have to push you because I think you're not somebody who's super expressive when right. you're when you're feeling emotions me i'm like a like a really <laughs> open book where it's like if i'm like concerned about something people are like are you okay yeah. <laughs> yeah but but i think you're more internal and so it's almost like you have to be more showy as an actor right. well, yeah like i to read i found that like the less i was feeling it actually the better it seemed to read mm -hmm. because like yeah my natural reaction when feeling emotion isn't to express it largely for a camera mm. uh, <laughs> when i was uh in 
college, my acting thesis was to do a one act play. And because I wanted to hurt myself, I chose a David Mamet 90 minute long play <laughs> where it's just me and this other woman on stage the entire time. Oh, man. Um, and when we finally did our little like one act festival, we did it three times. And after one of the performances, I said, oh, that was that felt great. And she said, oh, I didn't feel good. And the second performance, complete opposite. She felt great and I didn't feel good about it. Third performance, both of us felt bad about it. And I was like, you would hope that would be the one, right? <laughs> and so we both felt bad about it. But then I talked to um, someone in my class who had, who had to like sit through them and like be there in the audience and saw all three and was like, they were the same. It was fine. Like, it was great. You know, what are you talking about? And I talked to my acting teacher and, and she said, well, the important thing is you've done the work. You know, she says, once you've done the work and you know where you're coming from, you, there may be days where it's magical and you don't know where it came from. But even if you're at 80%, the work is what shows and that's what comes through. And I think that's kind of, it's, it's comforting at least to know <laughs> that it's still there. Yeah. I, I think that philosophy applies to other aspects of filmmaking Absolutely. as well. You know, when I think about even writing, you know, if you've done your preparation, if you've done your research, you've done enough outlining and structure work before you write that first draft, you don't have to necessarily be like always looking at your notes. You know, you've, this is a weird subconscious, you know, storage bank you've built up and you can kind of just your subconscious can now utilize that in not as a, a logical, like, you know, I'm going to take this part from my outline and put it in the script right here. It's, it's just, you've done the work and now you can actually get into that flow state from an informed place. And I think same with directing. If I've done my preparation, really thought about each scene, I can make on the fly decisions that seem like they come out of nowhere, but they actually are informed. It's just that right. subconscious you know, work has been done. Yeah, it comes back to process. Like we all develop our processes differently in terms of how we create something or do creative work. And no two people have the same process, but you have to have a process and it has to be based on some something, some work that you've done, some way that you have figured out how best to optimize your brain power. People like to talk about writing or any sort of creative work as though it's like magical. And we talk about like inspiration mm -hmm. just hits like right. a lightning mm -hmm. bolt. It's absolutely not true. Like we absolutely have to put the work in, drag yourself out. What did I read? Somebody said like writing is just a series of decisions to write. <laughs> oh, God, right. it's so true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that like hurts a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Just when you do not want to get up off of your couch, you do not want to go to your computer and open it and face that daunting blank page. It's just a series of decisions to do that. And that takes so much discipline and the process of enabling yourself to do that. So like for me, a big part of my process is just creating an environment for myself mm -hmm. in which I can enter into the creative work. Yeah. And so that looks like different for everybody. You know, for me, it's like I it's certain place in my house with like it has to be sunny outside. I can't deal with <laughs> rain and clouds and stuff like that. That's the opposite for me. I hate it when it's sunny. Really? Yeah, I can't write when it's sunny. You got to be in the Pacific <laughs> Northwest. I was going to say, you live in the wrong place. I know. Yeah. It's the worst place to be. Oh, uh, yeah. Seriously. Life in LA is so hard, everybody. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just creating that that space for yourself and then also developing that process. I was right working on something recently and reading it back to myself and feeling insecure about it. And then when I read it back, I was like, you know what? good or bad per se, because it's not done, but just the pages that I've written, they read very self-assured for what, you know, however you want to like interpret that. They read like, I know what I'm writing or I understand what writing is really well. Only now because I'm 12 years into my career, <laughs> you know? Right. And so like you might catch flashes of brilliance and stuff. And you, we talked on Goodwill Hunting about how young those guys were when they wrote that. But then we also talked about the process and how long it took. And that's just about maturity and developing and discipline and all of that stuff, which is not very sexy, but unfortunately very important. And for me, I think it's also feedback. Like, I think that's why yeah. having all of you guys is so helpful is because often, you know, I finished the first draft of the adaptation script and I, by the time I finish something, I have no idea if it's good or not. Just mm -hmm. like, okay, these are words. I put them in that order. <laughs> I don't know that the feedback is either going to be like, this is terrible start over or maybe people will like it. And I feel like with that first draft, everyone was like, no, it's pretty much working. There were just like some tweaky changes. And so I think having building some kind of uh, yeah, like support system to provide feedback for when you need to like kind of get snapped back 
to objectivity mm -hmm. is helpful and, and going through that feedback process in a way that is helpful and I think we've talked about that before but yeah for me feedback is a yeah. really big important part of well and, and of I think taking feedback and not not taking it as oh god I'm not good enough like this like it should have been perfect already but more just I now take it as oh thank god I now have these new sparks to like work off of you know new suggestions new directions things could go because my biggest hurdle with writing is when I'm in isolation and kind of in my own head I I feel very almost like I'm stuck in a closed loop like there's only a certain amount of ways that like Alex default thinks and Alex <laughs> yeah. default like decides to go mm -hmm. and I need almost like somebody to come in and like poke my brain and be like well what about this or what about this and then that just opens up a whole new pathway of like oh wow yeah what about that and that's where breakthroughs happen and I just yeah I just don't know how to do that on my own I need other people to come in and poke at me I find there's a point of the writing process where when you go back to try to do a revision or something you your brain just mm -hmm. it's like it's out of focus like I stare at the what I've written and I'm like it I can't even look at it anymore I don't even right. understand it anymore and <laughs> right. then it's like that's the point where you need someone else to give you feedback to make you go oh okay now I can sort of revisit and you know maybe you have to open up a blank document and start re completely from scratch just to kind of get it to like refocus but it's like there's a certain point where your brain becomes ineligible <laughs> to like right. give yourself any yeah. feedback. Yeah, yeah. Or you just read it and it's like, well, this is just what it is and I can't see how it could be anything else. And the, yeah. so I guess I give up. <laughs> and I think that's why time is an important element for me. Like whenever I'm writing a script, like I try to leave a day where between a draft, I have a day off. Mm -hmm. Or like at right. least I go to sleep and then come back to it the next day. Because I think having time lets me have that perspective. And that was kind of a scary moment when editing adaptation was there's, we did a first cut and there were notes and we needed to do another cut and there's only like three days left. But I was just like, <laughs> I, I don't think my brain can objectively add anything today. So we did like a day where you kind of, Alex, you started on the sound and doing other stuff and I kind of did some visual effects work, even knowing it was gonna get thrown out. But I think having that day of like, we're not thinking about it in editing terms today then allowed us to come back the next day right. and like really take care of it. That's why with Hollywood, you end up with sequels and things like that that end up, I think, being lackluster is because there's not a respect of that part of the process or how long the process actually takes. So mm -hmm. you, you, you have a studio that's trying to rush through something. They don't give the writers time to write a good script because no matter how brilliant you are, again, you have to have the process. These breaks, these stops, these are all a part of the process. And so then you end up with crappy sequels because they're so concerned about getting something out they can start making money on. Then there's not enough time for the process piece. I think yeah, space is such a hugely underrated part of the creative process. Yes. Just that off time for your brain to not be so, yeah, like I said, in those closed loops where you've been doing the same thing for so long, nothing new is happening anymore. You really are just like an echo chamber for yourself. Which is why it's important to take breaks and play Beat Saber <laughs> when, yes. when writing. <laughs> exactly. It's like I always say. <laughs> Literally, I've been you know, editing an LFTS video over at Michael's house, and I'm like, oh, where's Michael? What's going on? And I'll walk out into his living room, and literally, he's in, he's doing what you see in the movie. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's a good way to like shake your brain loose. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the moral of the story is that writing is really hard. <laughs> and <laughs> adaptation captures that extremely well. Yep. Word. So why don't we quickly go around and talk about what lessons we're going to take away from adaptation, both perhaps the short and the movie. Uh, Trisha, would you like to start? Sure. I think for me, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about not trying not to judge my characters and trying to find their humanity and be as honest as I can be about their humanity, which is, of course, my humanity and all of our humanity. Kaufman talks a lot about being oneself or like being yourself. And we sometimes talk about this in Hollywood about like, well, what, why are you the person to tell this story? What is the story that only you can tell? And this to me is, of course, the story that only Charlie Kaufman can tell. And it is going, you know, Charlie 
when you read interviews with him, he's like, is it is it useful to anybody? Could it possibly be useful? And he worries that in the movie. Like, this is right. narcissistic and self-absorbed and it couldn't possibly be useful to anybody. But when we're being the most honest about ourselves is when we are being the most useful because we recognize each other's humanity. And so I tend to judge, I think, judge my character sometimes. Like, this is the villain. They're doing villainous things. And... It doesn't work that way. You have to find the humanity in everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Brian? So there's this interview that Kaufman did for Wired in 2008 when Synecdoche, New York was coming out. And the interview was two and a half hours long. And the interviewer actually just put a recorder there and, and recorded the whole thing and actually just put it online. So you hear these guys awesome. like hanging out and uh, ordering food and whatever. And it's actually very Kaufman-esque because... They, they end up talking about the process of interviews. <laughs> so it's like an interview <laughs> about being interviewed. Um, but then the the interviewer brings up this idea of recursion, which is uh, like a logical problem, something that contains itself. Uh, so if you look at Malkovich and Eternal Sunshine, you have a character going into their own brain. And adaptation is about writing the movie that you're watching. And Synecdoche, New York, Philip Seymour Hoffman wants to make it an, a theater piece that contains his entire life, which means he has to get someone to play himself. But then he realizes there's this guy following him around. So he has to hire someone to play the guy who follows him around, <laughs> you know, uh, and that kind of thing. And uh, And it's really cute because... Kaufman goes, do you know uh, Paris, Las Vegas, that casino? And the and the interviewer is like, are you are you going to say what I, I think you're going to say? I had the same idea. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, Las Vegas, Las Vegas. And Kaufman's like, yeah, what's your idea? And he's like, it's a, it's a casino in Las Vegas where you go inside and it's all Las Vegas. And when you get to where the casino is, there's a tinier one. And Kaufman's <laughs> like, that's my idea. Too. <laughs> and it, so, it sounds sort of corny, but it's like sometimes the thing that sounds gimmicky is actually, this is like the lesson I'm finally getting to. Uh, the, the thing that sounds gimmicky is like, that's actually okay to do it if you handle it well. Something like writing a movie that you're watching sounds stupid. It sounds like that's goofy, but it's like, it is goofy, but it's also like, you can you can get away with it, you know? Um, Chuck Palahniuk in Fight Club 2, the graphic novel, uh, wrote himself into it and mm. it's really stupid. But <laughs> at the end... Uh, he decides to kill off Tyler Durden. So Tyler Durden comes out of the book and to murder him. So <laughs> it does oh, pay wow. off. Uh, I'm like, that's actually kind of cool. Um, but the, one of my favorite um, British comedies, uh, Peep Show, yeah, uh, where it, the it's every every shot is from the character's point of view, and you hear their internal monologue and stuff. And it sounds Olivia Coleman, one of the first yes, things. Yes, exactly. I, um, but uh, it sounds really corny but it's like once you start watching it you forget about that aspect a few minutes in and you're just watching a comedy so it's like as long as you're not focusing on the gimmick you can get away with things that are kind of gimmicky well and if you choose them for a very specific reason to make a comment exactly. on something that the gimmick addresses right. or is already embedded in the gimmick yeah awesome cool alex uh well my lesson is probably more from the short film process but also can be applied to any good movie i would suppose which I think as a director, just remembering that simplicity works really, you know, I think sometimes, especially thinking about, yeah, film school us, <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to do like so many layers of things in every scene. It's going to be like the matrix where something symbolizes something. And, you know, the shot's going to be really weird because it's like a cool, weird shot. And I, I went kind of back to basics with this short where I, I've been reading this uh, David Mamet classic book called On Film Directing or On Directing Film. And you know, I didn't resonate with all of it. It's a little bit old fashioned fuddy duddy in some parts, but he does just really hammer home, you know, your job as the director is very basic. It's like, what is the idea of this scene? What is the one thing the audience needs to get from this scene? Every shot you choose is just communicating that idea. And that is your only job. Stop with all like the frills and bells and whistles. Like that's your job. And it was really fun on this project to go into the you know shot listing with that in mind of, you know, this scene is about Michael being really irritated with Zach interrupting his, you know, researching. So what is just the best series of shots to do that? And it was rewarding to see it come together in the edit where it's like, okay, yeah, I, I just went into each scene with that intent and each scene actually played because we've had a lot of experiences, Michael, where we've, we've tried stuff out in a short film, we get to the editing room and it's like, oh, the the scene isn't playing like we imagined it. It's just kind of falling flat or is the audience going to get it? And it just reminded me that just the simple, straightforward, get the idea across and then it all will just do the work for you. Um, that's my lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And I can 
confirm of like when we started editing it, it was really nice that it was just the scene played and there was all the right shots to tell the story. Like there was a shot of like, this moment is about me and Zach and there's a shot of me and Zach or like, this is the shot of me reacting to the computer and like it, all the elements were there to enhance what the scene was about. So very good job. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that was kind of going to be my lesson was the simplicity thing. Oh, sorry. Um, but I think it, I think maybe I can talk about it more from the writing perspective of of we we've touched on it before, but the the simplicity of you know in this story, there's you know my character is very simple, and people bring knowledge of me from the channel into it, I guess. But as far as like in this world, in this narrative, my character is a guy that is stressed and wants to make the best thing by this time like and that is all and zach's character is you know his opposite and like they're just very simple but in a way that i think doesn't mean that they're one-dimensional and i think finding i think basically that's kind of what i'm trying to arrive at is that you can have simplicity without uh having a one-dimensional character where right it's like give them a simple simple singular clear desire but like the journey that they go on takes them to places where they express other parts of their character. And I think that's... And the, and the way they go after the desire is... Right, is how they do it. Three-dimensional. Yeah, so I think that's... Yeah, trying to really embrace that and explore that because I think that, that was the most re rewarding part for me, I think, of finishing the short was that I felt like each scene pushed my character to do the next thing and like to learn the lessons in a way that felt that you could buy into it. And I think part of that was making the desire very clear and simple and the theme and lesson very simple and yeah, just pushing it as far as you can with that. So simplicity is good. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> uh, all right, really quick. What is uh, everyone been watching this week, Alex? So I, I saw this a couple weeks ago or three weeks ago and I don't think it's in theaters anymore, but I saw Climax by Gaspar No. Oh boy. Or Noe, I don't, how do you say his name? Uh, Noe? Noe, I think, Noe, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you've ever seen a Gaspar Noe film, you know what you're in for, so you may not want to see it if you're not into <laughs> visceral, shocking, controversial, uh, intense movie experiences. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> but if you are, I thought it was fantastic, uh, if horrifying. <laughs> it's a really, all of his movies, you know, I've, I, I first saw him uh in enter the void it was my first gaspar no way experience and that movie just completely blew my mind because he is just so ambitious with what he tries to do i mean that film basically not really spoilers for that movie but the second like second two-thirds of that movie you're basically a disembodied perspective after somebody dies like zooming around parts of tokyo like looking at different things happening <laughs> <laughs> and it's like insane but somehow it works and you, it gives you such a feeling that only like a movie can give you where you're just like i don't know you know what i am anymore i'm just like in this experience mm -hmm. and um he does the same thing with climax where it's just you know, the, the premise of it is basically and it's based on i guess a real thing that happened where a dance troupe was having this like party in like an abandoned like school gymnasium and somebody spiked the punch with lsd and so the night just devolves into madness and like horrible things happen <laughs> so it's really dark but it's just shot so incredibly where i think the last half of the movie is like a long take unless they stitched it but i couldn't tell where they stitched it and it's just it's dancers and it's like a the camera's turning upside down and it's weaving through rooms and it's just an amazing cinematic experience so if you're down for shocking horrific things to happen and you're okay with that in a movie <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> Someone asked me if I wanted to watch that, and I went, nope. Do not watch it, Trisha. You <laughs> will not appreciate it. <laughs> well, I sat through love. and Okay. Uh, that's that's as emotionally intense in yeah, a lot of ways. Yeah. It's just not my kind of movie. Yeah. Respect to the filmmaker. Well, what is your kind of movie, Trisha? What have you been watching? Thank you for asking, Michael. Um, so I recently, for the first time, watched the original Catch-22 from 1970, Mike Nichols directed, um, and it's an adaptation of the Joseph Heller novel. Obviously, it stars Alan Arkin, who's a total dreamboat. <laughs> and 
I mean, every like t- everybody's in it. I mean, Anthony Perkins is in it. Young John Voight is in it. Like, every, it's so good. Um, and I'd heard that it was not good. The, the book is one of my favorite books of all time. And for some reason, I let that get in the way of me actually watching this movie. Like, I don't know. Somehow some people said to me, like, oh, it's don't watch the movie. It's no good. It's no good. And it, it, of course, it would be challenging material to adapt because it's, you know, of course, if you don't know, it's about American soldiers. Uh, they're actually pilots in the in North Africa fighting in like the Mediterranean theater during like World War II. And it's about the absurdity of war. Like all war movies are sort of about the horror of war. And it's certainly horrifying, but it's also hilarious and absurd. Um, and so the logic is really like uh, circular and it's absurd, you know. Um, and the the book is really challenging. So I was expecting anybody who was going to be making this movie to fail at it. But honestly, I really liked it. I thought it worked really well. I was also interested. George Clooney is making a mini series that oh, is he's adapting it, which is worrisome. Having seen Monuments Men, <laughs> so we'll see. I liked Good Night and Good Luck. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I'm excited to check out George Clooney's <laughs> version of it, but you can also check out 1970 version of Catch 22. Awesome, Brian. I like George Clooney's. Uh, version of charlie kaufman's script confessions of a dangerous mind yeah. although charlie kaufman did not i know yeah yeah <laughs> um so a friend of mine uh invited me to see a screening of the new harmony kareen movie the beach bum uh which stars matthew mcconaughey isla fisher snoop dogg jonah hill zach efron jimmy buffett and martin lawrence oh my God. Uh, <laughs> i want to see those <laughs> I think I really want to see this. <laughs> I will not say it's a good movie, but everyone in the world should see it. It's like <laughs> uh, Harmony Kareen has what he's, it's called liquid cinema. It's like when a movie focuses more on a mood than a story or characters or making any freaking sense, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, think about like Drive, Scott Pilgrim, Quantum of Solace, Fear and Loathing, like mo- very different movies, but all movies where it's like this sort of emotional mood or like through line of the movie is as much a a point of it as the story itself if there is a story um but uh so the movie was really interesting but then there was a q a afterwards with <laughs> harmony kareen matthew mcconaughey uh <laughs> stefania levy owen who plays his daughter in the movie who she plays the straight role in the movie and was the straight role in the q a she's the only one being <laughs> wow. like hello i'm a young actress i would like to answer your questions everyone else <laughs> And then Jonah Hill showed up because he was driving by the Arclight, texted Harmony Kareen and was like, hey, I'm driving by the Arclight. Congrats on the movie. And he's like, we're doing a QA and a in 10 minutes. And Jonah Hill's like, I found parking on Sunset, ran in and here I am. <laughs> so he wasn't even prepared. To, he was just hanging out like, hey, guys, I'm here, too. This um, is the most L.A. thing that's ever right. happened. Oh, my but, God. But then it's like the Q&A, like I... I I felt like I was in a dream that I couldn't wake up from because like if you've seen <laughs> Harmony Kareen interviews, you know that he's like not interested in like answering your question or whatever. So the interviewer who was trying very hard <laughs> to have keep... a Q&A with him. <laughs> yeah. The interviewer is trying very hard to like keep it all together. He's like, he's like, what was it like shooting in Florida? You know, your second movie you shot in Florida. And he's like, oh, I like Florida. I live there. There's sun. They have Taco Bell. I like Taco Bell. And you're like, oh, God, <laughs> it's like that was all of his exhausting. answers. <laughs> Which was nothing compared to Matthew McConaughey, (laughs) who gave the most Matthew McConaughey answers to every question. Like the character's name is Moondog, and the interviewer is like, "Like, uh, so do you think there's a little uh, little Moondog in you?" And he's like, "Well, I hope so. I think there's a little Moondog in all of us." Moon, Moon Dog's a poet, and this movie's a poem, and life is poetry. It's a poem of joy. <laughs> and uh, Moon Dog experiences a crisis in this movie, but he doesn't give it credit. And if you don't give credit to crisis, then crisis doesn't have credit. Time is a flat circle. Love is the fourth dimension. All right, all right, all right. Like I'm not exaggerating. It was like Just that associating. <laughs> yeah. And, and my so friend, that sounds amazing. My friend and I walked out of there, and we felt high. Like we were just. Right. Like, I feel so. We were walking down Hollywood, high. Hollywood Boulevard to the Star Wars bar. So none of that helps, you know, no, it like, feel grounded. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we we just we felt really weird for about ten minutes. Like the movie was weird. The Q and A was weirder. Wonderful. Wow. Wow. Well, you should have gone last. <laughs> <laughs> what are you watching, Michael? Uh, uh, on Monday, uh, I saw Us. Uh, which was interesting and I have a lot of thoughts about uh, it seems like a trend I've noticed is that if you really loved Get Out you don't like us and if you were kind of like meh about Get Out you seem to really love us Mm. Um, so 
take that into consideration when going. I, I thought it was really interesting. I thought there was some good directing by Jordan Peele. And I would say the first 20 to 30 minutes I loved and I thought were great. And then it kind of becomes what it becomes. And it has a lot of problems, I think, mostly on a like script story level. So, but it was it was an interesting experience. And I think it's a fun movie to have seen. And I think, again, a lot of people really, really love it. So um, anyway, it, it was an interesting experience. And I'm Curious to see now. I think part of it was I hadn't really slept the previous night because I saw yeah. the day we released the adaptation <laughs> mm-hmm. movie, so that didn't help anything. But I think I went in kind of ready to compare it to Get Out, and mm. a lot of the things Get Out did super well that I loved. This movie kind of doesn't even try to do. Like, it isn't concerned with some of those things, which is, I think, that Get Out made some of the choices it did is why I liked it since I don't generally like horror films and this film seemed less concerned with taking care of that. So, but I think it's, I think it's worth checking out. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed our discussion of adaptation. Be sure to subscribe to beyond the screenplay, wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review on iTunes. It really, really helps us grow the channel. And finally, thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.